Howdy! Well, I'm known as Dimwit, the last mountain man, feared throughout the land. And today it's all going to be about Remington rolling blocks. And behind me here I have six rifles and I also have a handgun. So we got, uh, and we're going to shoot with every one of them. We got uh, four civilian sporting rifles and we got three military guns. Uh, military rifle, carbine and uh, pistol. So I think we'll uh, start with the civilian guns. And um, we're going to start with the smallest uh, uh, rolling, uh, Remington rolling block ever made. And uh, that's the uh, number four. It'll be kind of a boy's rifle. This is a solid frame one and then they started uh, making takedown ones with the uh, first they had a screw on the side here and then they changed to a lever but this is an early one with a solid frame and it, 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 uh, it really is a nicely made gun. It's, there's nothing cheap cheaply made about it even though I'm sure it was an inexpensive gun for young boys. This one is in uh, 32 rimfire and uh, I reload my own 32 rimfires. If you've seen any of my earlier rimfire videos uh, you might have Notice that. And uh, so this is a 32 rim fire. But this is not truly a rim fire. This is a modern reloadable one with um, it's using 22 blanks as a primer. Okay. I'll cock the hammer and open the action. Like that. Ooh, that was loud. forget maybe today I'll be good about this like so so the one I tried now was uh, 32 long and I also have uh, 32 shorts we'll try that see if we can notice any difference Quite a big difference. We'll do one more. Okay, so that was the number four smallest rolling block ever made. And then we move on to number two. And this is a little bigger, but it's not full size. So maybe this wouldn't be a boy, young boy's rifle, maybe this would be a youth gun or a ladies gun or just a person of small stature or older person with bad joints and things like that <clears throat> uh, and 
and I feel maybe this is one of the most underappreciated of the rolling blocks because this is really nicely done and you can really tell when you work the action it's like a Swiss watch I suppose and this one is also in 32 rim fire By the way, that was the first time I ever fired that uh, number four, and this is going to be the first time I ever fire this number two. Who knows how long it's been? Really pleasant gun to shoot with. Let's try one more. Okay, that was the number two. And then I have a model one and a half. And this looks very much like the full size original number one. But it is actually a little smaller. But it's kind of a full size gun, I'd have to say. And this one, this one is also in 32 rim fire. And that seems to be a lot of gun for such a small cartridge. But that's what it is, so that's what we're going to shoot. Uh, inside bore diameter is the same as a 303 British. I was kind of tempted to rechamber it for that, but uh, I'm not sure if the rate of twist would be right. And uh, and they never chambered these one and a half model guns in anything bigger than the 4440. So I figured, well, a 303 is a bit much, even though it is. A black powder cartridge originally so let's shoot it There we go. We'll do it one more time. So Okay. So that was the model one and a half. It's kind of hard to find these.
And then this is probably the most expensive gun here today. Uh, this is a Model 1 sporting rifle. Uh, it's an early one, you can tell by the configuration of the tip of the forearm here and, and uh, the shape of these, uh, if I remember correctly. And, and, uh, and this is almost identical to um, the gun that uh, General Custer carried at the uh, Battle of Little Bighorn, except uh, his was in uh, 5070, and this one isn't. So, you have this beach folding front sight. And you have this rough and ready rear sight. Uh, it's an open sight here. And this folds up. And it's a peep sight. That you just turn this and slide it up and down, tighten it. So it's a really nice gun. Uh, it's been uh, he finished uh, at least partially. And this gun has been changed into a 4440 caliber. So uh, I'm sure it used to be a buffalo gun, but it's not anymore. And that's kind of too bad because that hurts its value, but it's still a very nice gun. So this is a 4440 cartridge. Uh, you know, they're popular in Winchesters and even handguns. And, and I always like to use black powder, the real thing, in my antique guns. But I didn't have any 4440 in black powder. I don't really have reloading equipment for it. So this is a smokeless round. and. This is something I usually advise people not to do, is to shoot smokeless ammo in an old black powder gun. But I've done it before with this one, and the loads aren't really that uh, hot, and uh, the Remington rolling block is a really strong action, and the gun is in good condition, so we're going to be alright, but um, I would have preferred black powder and uh, even when you load smokeless rounds to the same velocity as the original black powder rounds um, you're still you see that the, um, the pressure curve of black powder rises kind of slowly and steadily and um, it builds up pressure behind that bullet throughout the barrel but the smokeless powder is, tends to, uh, of course there are different ones, but anyway it's going to build pressure faster and higher most of the time. So um, use black powder in black powder guns. It's way more fun anyway. It's got the nicer sound to it. <laughs> that you got the smoke and the smell and all the things a growing boy needs. So. But we're going to shoot it anyway. Oh, doesn't smell right.
at all. Well, we'll give it one more chance. So. You could hear by the sound of the gun that it was really a, a powerful load. Still a little bit of a recoil. And there's uh, an interesting thing I have to show you with this gun. This gun has been shortened a little bit, um, quite a bit, because this here, where the screw for the forend goes in, that used to be here. So the gun has been shortened this much, okay? And um, it's got the serial number 324 here, but. Uh, in here it's got uh, it says 44 44 so this was probably a 44 caliber uh, large buffalo type caliber of some sort and uh, then somebody changed it into uh, a 4440 and that wasn't the smartest thing to do because that really hurt its value but it's still uh, an interesting gun and a valuable gun. But, um, and it's just like brand new inside the bore. But I, I've been thinking about maybe having this uh, re-bored and re-chambered to 5070. That would make it almost identical to uh, Custer's gun. And that would be kind of fun. We'll see. Okay, moving over to the uh, military department. Uh, this is a New York militia model rifle. I think they call a model 1871, but they were made in 1872. And uh, and they're a little bit unique compared to other military rolling blocks. It's got this huge, great big hammer that sticks straight up, and uh, that's really easy to get grabbed a hold of even if your fingers are cold and you're scared to death and whatnot and uh, and it blocks the view when the hammer is down so you know, if you're going to shoot and uh, and the gun is actually not ready to fire you're going to notice right away so that's a good thing and um, but uh, it has a unique uh, feature when you open this gun and load it and close it you cannot pull the trigger until you lower it into uh, half cock and then back up. Uh, and that was a safety feature. And um, I don't know if that's good or bad, actually. But th it is what it is. And uh, when I read about these, I, I noticed that several places it says that when you close the gun it drops the hammer into half cock but this one doesn't uh, it the hammer stays pretty much at full cock but um, uh, you have to lower it to half cock first before you can fire it 
and uh, that makes more sense to me because I be kind of scary to have a gun drop to half cock every time you close the action I think so, so I'm thinking this is the way it should be and what I've been reading is uh, not so uh, and this is uh, caliber 5070 uh, and uh, that was a popular round uh, you know and the 4570 took over kind of after that in 1873 um, a lot of buffaloes were hunted with uh, the 5070, probably more than any other caliber. Um, this gun has some uh, regimental markings and stuff uh, that could be further investigated. It's got the TC on the top of the butt here and. Uh, it says 44 here, and uh, this, uh, you can tell by the looks of this gun, it's been handled a lot, but there's not, not a speck of rust in it, and uh, there's no uh, corrosion of any kind inside the bore, it's just like brand new inside, and there's uh, no, uh, there's no rattle <laughs> anywhere. So it's been carried a lot, handled a lot, and it hasn't been shot a whole lot, and it's been taken really good care of. And that's kind of typical of uh, the military guns. You know, you can bang them around all you want, but damn well better clean it and keep it uh, in shape. So um, it's nice to find these uh, old military guns in such wonderful shape inside. If they're not, it's be probably because they had a civilian life afterwards. Uh, quite the opposite is true with the, the civilian guns. A lot of them will look real nice on the outside, but some idiot didn't clean it and it looks like trash on the inside. So that's the difference between military guns and civilian guns, I guess. So, and, and I haven't never shot this one either. The only gun I ever shot before here is that uh, 4440. And uh, who knows when uh, this been shot last time, you know, it could be, could be a century. And uh, the 5070 is, uh, good size cartridge so put it in half cock bring it back up wow that was unexpected. I think maybe the firing pin is too short on this gun. I never bothered to check. And of course I have to bring it back down. Again, it's that safety feature. No. Okay. So that's what happens sometimes when you don't do your homework. Just barely touched it. So, back to the shop. But. I have another 5070, and that's a military carbine. Okay. All of these Remingtons of mine are original antique Remington made ones, made in the USA. Of course, these were made on license in many, many countries, in some places even without a license. Uh, 
and uh, not sure about this one. It seems to have a New York militia hammer, but it's not quite up to specs with the New York militia guns because it doesn't have those safety features. And so, uh, and I'm not sure if that rear sight has been on this carbine originally. It is for. Uh, uh, it is for a uh, rolling block carbine, but uh, maybe not this one. And um, so maybe it's been kind of put together, but it's still a nice gun. Yeah, it, it's it got no play or rattle in it. it and, uh, it's just like new inside the bore. So let's see. There we go. <sighs> it didn't kick as bad as I expected, but <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> but um, uh, these cartridges hold less powder than the old original ones, and. Uh, so it's a good idea to use what we call Swiss powder uh, in uh, cartridge guns uh, because um, that's about 15% more powerful and that will make it more like the original uh, performance. But I don't have the Swiss powder so this is ordinary 3FG black powder. Let's try it again. Like so. <laughs> it's still qu quite a bit of recoil. Uh, <coughs> A lot of smoke. <clears throat> so um, let's try the that one that did go off in the rifle. There you go. So have uh, one more gun and that is a model 1871 army pistol 50 caliber so this is quite a man stopper and uh, I have um, oh, I'll let you have a closer look at it first I have made some ammo for it and my ammo is not historically correct, but it will still work. So uh, a little banged up underneath here. But it's uh, it's in good shape. So here's the ammo I made. Let's uh, shoot it first, and then I'll tell you more about how I made and loaded these things. Oh, good Lord. I don't think it's closed completely. Let's see. It's got a, it's got a 
stiff trigger pull. Um, and my hands are getting cold, but it, it worked and uh, it was fun to shoot. So I think we're going to have to try it again. Let me talk uh, a little bit about how I made the ammo. Now, the, I used cut down 50 70 brass and uh, I uh, these are not the right length actually they're supposed to be shorter uh, but I made them as long as I could uh, without hitting the lands of the rifling and uh, then I use round balls in them A 51 caliber round ball is perfect for the bore in them guns and I forced a bullet through there and it leaves a nice flat uh, rifled band all the way around it and that's going to keep things sealed and, and, and it's going to engage the rifling nicely and it's going to be uh, accurate. Uh, but um, even it, it would kind of fit loosely in the brass. So what I did is I dipped my balls in uh, melted beeswax and then, then they look like this. And then they all fit in there quite nicely. And uh, I just uh, scraped the excess off with my fingernails and so there's inside here there's uh, beeswax. And that keeps it in there and helps lubricate uh, the bore and keeps the fouling softer and so that's good. So this is an easy way to reload uh, some of these uh, old calibers without uh, having to buy expensive uh, reloading dies and expensive uh, uh, bullet molds and um, so what I do is I um, I have a bench vise like this and it kind of pivots to any position I need so I've clamped this onto my bench and I tilt it back like that and I I use and I have uh, removed the jaws they screwed in there and they're serrated I didn't want that and we have nice flat surfaces and I uh, use this to uh, press the primers in and and, uh, and press the bullets in if necessary that's also how I reloaded um, the, the 50 70 cartridges with this um, but for the 50 70 I, I did buy a, a Lee bullet mold and um, so don't really have to have expensive reloading equipment to shoot some of these things and this is the bullet mold for that 51 caliber round ball and uh, this is made uh, in England a company that makes any th caliber you want and uh, they're not expensive and they're really high quality you have to cut the sprue off with a suitable tool 
uh, but that's no problem. So, so uh, anyway, that was a nice, uh, easy, inexpensive way to put uh, this uh, handgun back to life. And I think now you have to shoot it once more. That's fun. Okay. And um, I like to make things. I'll show you uh, some things that I made. I, I, I kept this in this holster today, and, and this is a holster that I made myself. And uh, usually I have a Remington new model army in here, but uh, this one fits in there nicely as well, so Like so Kind of enjoy working with leather uh, This is my last resort of the day and It's also something that I made I had a blade from a bayonet or a combat knife made in at the Kongsberg uh, weapons factory in Norway and it's never been used and uh, I made it into a knife and I made this sheath it's got the rough side of the leather out and it's supposed to tuck it inside your pants and this goes on the outside and maybe the belt on top of that so it's kind of a hidden thing uh, or it could be a boot knife so this is the kind of things that I like to make and I brought something else along here today because I didn't know if I was going to be able to shoot them rifles because my shoulder has been bothering me and, uh, and this it's kind of a cane that I use when I'm uh, walking on snowshoes and it's uh, got this thing on the end here that's a uh, um, hoose antler that's uh, fashioned into a kind of a cup and that keeps it from sinking down into the snow and this cane is made from a, uh, I think it's what you call Scandinavian juniper it, and this is and they kind of grow like this and then up and they make nice handles for a cane and a leather wrapped it and did some carving on it these are some one of the things I enjoy doing. So, um, I hope you have enjoyed my video here today. And if you haven't subscribed already, maybe you should. I have a lot of other videos out there, and I got lots of more plans. And so, um, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, go ahead. I'll try answer the best I can and you know, click like and uh, catch you later.